From the I-24 News Studios in Times Square in New York, this is Crossroads with David Schuster and Michelle McCorry. Good evening. The UK terror threat level has been raised to critical following an attack in London. A bucket bomb exploded, rocking commuters during rush hour and injuring 29 people. A manhunt for the perpetrator continues. Islamic State has claimed responsibility for the attack, and this was the sixth terror attack in Great Britain this year. Correspondent Mike Kay has the latest. This cell phone video showing the apparent bucket bomb that detonated inside a London train, still burning. Oh, is that bad? on fire. And you can hear Metro Police ordering the passengers left on the platform to evacuate. Guys, let's get away and let's move right down the end of the platform. Let's get away. But according to eyewitnesses, most commuters escaped even before police arrived, panicked. People were just getting crushed and we were just trampling each other and it was just every man for themselves. I genuinely thought I was going to die. It was just the sheet of orange flame and this huge bang, and obviously everyone screamed and ran off. It happened just after 8 a.m. in London at Parsons Green Tube Station. The pandemonium sending dozens to hospital, most from flash burns. It's kind of frightening and scary. I mean, right now, I just can't believe it. Investigators calling this a terror attack immediately launched a search for the attacker or attackers, revealing the device did not explode fully. President Trump weighed in from the White House. We have to be very smart. We have to be very, very tough. But the president's earlier tweets, including one implying the suspects were known to London officials, drew this criticism from the British Prime Minister, Theresa May. I never think it's helpful for anybody to speculate on what is an ongoing investigation. And that was Mike Kay reporting. For more on the terrorist attack in London, let's bring in our panel, Dr. Judy Josser, founder and president of the American Islamic Forum for Democracy. Also with us, our senior diplomatic correspondent, Nina Larson, our senior Washington correspondent, Dan Raviv, and I-24 News anchor and correspondent, Tyle Heinrich. Thank you all. And uh, Dan, I'd like to start with you. The terror threat level now raised to critical. What exactly does that mean? That means that it is believed that an attack may be imminent. It also tells me that the police did not catch whoever created the bomb that went off in a tube train at the Parsons Green Station in southwest London. And that person, of course, could make more bombs, have more timers and try again. And maybe other people are involved. So Scotland Yard, in effect, the national police, the counterterrorism forces in Britain uh, do believe that it could happen again, at least there. It makes me wonder, of course, what about the United States? Washington, D.C., where I live, also has a transit system, including subway trains. Of course, New York City has the largest system. Um, unfortunately, it's too easy for somebody to make a bomb, an improvised device, and maybe put it in a plastic bucket. Here's the question. If you were riding on the train and you saw a bucket on the ground and you didn't think you could figure out whose that is, would you say something? You're supposed to. If you see something odd, we must be vigilant. And even in Britain, it seems like people got out of the habit of being suspicious. David and Michelle. Nina you know, Larson, you have spent a lot of your career, your life in London. Uh, anything jump out at you about either the location or when this happened or the significance of what was going on? Uh, yes, David, this almost seems to me like a, a failed attempt. Uh, Parsons Green is way out in the suburbs in West London, quite near Wimbledon, where the famous tennis uh, tournaments are held. It's a sort of leafy suburb. And the, the district line that this uh, device was put on goes right into central London, into Westminster, the embankment, and right through into the city of London, the main financial centre. So my initial thought was this was a, a failure, that it went off prematurely, it didn't go off properly, because if you were really going for maximum impact it would be in that rush hour in the tube in the depths of the earth this was overground there's an area outside the city where the, the tube is above ground and i think for maximum terrorist impact maximum casualties among civilians it i think this was probably aimed to go further into the city and it reminds me of the 7-7 attacks in uh, uh, 2005, uh, that was uh, Al-Qaeda, and that was when there were three suicide bombings on the London Underground, and a lot of people were killed and maimed, and uh, that was obviously a highly coordinated attack. And this almost seems like something was meant to be on that scale, and it didn't go right, or it could just be a lone wolf. It could be someone inspired by ISIS. We're seeing quite a lot of that lately, but it almost seems that I, I highly doubt Parsons Green was an actual target. Mm. 
Dr. Jasser, the uh, sixth attack in London so far this year. What is your reaction? Well, I think we are obviously at war, and I hope and pray that uh, our populations in the West don't look at this as a new normal. Uh, the UK police and, and uh, Home Office have said that they have 500 cases that are open involving 3,000 individuals with 20,000 at risk. So as we continue to squeeze ISIS more and more in Syria and in northern Iraq, ISIS was quick to put on their Amak uh, news service a, a credit for this, uh, saying that they, op they, they mobilized their unit and they thanked them for their operation. So ultimately, as we squeeze them more, we're going to see more acts. This wasn't a suicide operation, and that's why an attack is imminent many times. That's why probably this one had partial failure, was they're just doing something in order to do it quickly while they're being attacked and squeezed in the Middle East. And we need to, to shift our access to the violent extremism, which is the act of terror, to the precursors of radicalism, which are violent Islamism, and we have yet to do that. And until the West does that, uh, the Home Office in the UK, America, French, Belgium, and EU, et cetera, we're going to continue to this, continue this whack-a-mole program. Tal Heinrich, you've been covering uh, terror attacks and all sorts of other stuff in Israel for the past several years. What do you make of what happened in London? Well, it's... A new era for Europe, that's a first, and that's the new type of terrorism. Once again, the lone wolf attacks that we've been experiencing, unfortunately. And it's not only London, Paris, or Barcelona. We have to remember that only recently there was another stabbing attack in Finland. And back in April, it was Stockholm in Sweden, a ramming attack. And, um, well, we just talked about 9-11 a few days ago here in the studio. We talked about how the American public viewed terrorism prior to 9-11 through the prism of Middle East conflict, and then it changed. So in some respect, this is what Europe is going through right now. On one hand, the sense of insecurity and vulnerability. On the other hand, some sense of unity. Mm. Dr. Jasser, if it's Al-Qaeda, if it's ISIS, if it's Hezbollah, if it's Hamas, if it's Al-Shabaab, it all comes back down to that radical Islamist ideology that you mentioned earlier. How do you go about changing that ideology? We have to understand where the Muslim population is and its history. And as much as I agree, we, we have this tendency to say lone wolf, but I would actually be careful in using that. These are not lone actors. It's a global ideology that has a common source, which is Islam still, the faith that I love, is in that stage of fighting against theocracy. The West, Western secular democracies were created in this battle against theocracy. We're just two, three hundred years later now in Islam, finally going through that until the West starts to work with reformist organizations. Our Muslim reform movement is focusing on that need to defeat not only ISIS, but any Muslim group that believes in Islam being an identity movement, whether it's Hamas, the Muslim Brotherhood, the Khomeinist of Iran, the Taliban, the common oxygen for all these groups is the fact that they believe the state law should be Sharia, and any government that is not run by that is infidels, is not you know, uh, according to their dictates of Islam. And there are Muslims who love the West, who love secular law, who need to fight against that. And until Homeland Security starts to operationalize us in an ideological battle against the imams and others that are infusing these ideas, you're going to constantly see a whack-a-mole from al-Qaeda to ISIS to some other caliphate group and from every lone actor uh, that will continue to recur. Dan Raviv, obviously, the United States is a much uh, more difficult distance for people with that kind of ideology. Plus, the Muslim community in the United States is better integrated, perhaps better off economically than that in Europe. But is there ex the expectation in the Trump administration and even on Capitol Hill that it's inevitable that some type of, whether it's lone wolf attack or more organized attack, is coming to the United States? You're touching on a very sensitive issue because as a candidate, Donald Trump suggested that foreigners and immigrants can be dangerous. In general, of course, he and his administration now say uh, that if you are a U.S. citizen, you're legitimately here, but there are all sorts of dangers. One reason he says he wants to build a wall on the Mexican border is to keep out not just drug smuggling, but terrorists who could cross the border. Uh, it is a delicate issue because, well, uh, the FBI 
FBI keeps an eye on some people who live in the United States? Do they keep an eye on mosques? Do they depend on tips that come from the Muslim community? I know our guest, Dr. Josser, would be very well aware and apparently doesn't think enough is being done to keep an eye out for radicals, but the sensitive point is to whether innocent Muslims who are good citizens are also, well, the subjects of too much surveillance here. I'm kind of wondering what Dr. Josser might think about that. Is there too much security surveillance and suspicion here? Well, if I can just uh, add to that, I think that it's not a, bi a binary issue. It's not they're either good Muslims or terrorists. There is a continuum there. And when you have an imam in California who uses his sermon to, to demonize all Jews and screed, give screeds of anti-Semitism about the Temple Mount and conspiracy theories, that needs to be exposed, not need to be outlawed. We shouldn't take away his right to freedom of speech, but it needs to be marginalized and made out to be what it is, which is hate speech. And until we Muslims expose those imams and clerics as being part of the radicalization process. You can't solve it from government because, you know, I saw President Trump's tweet today about shutting off the internet, etc. It sounds good, but there's no way to do that. Any society that ends up pushing these movements underground, as Turkey will tell you, as Egypt will tell you, as Hezbollah Tahrir we saw in London uh, when they tried to make it illegal, actually flourish them rather than exposing them. So you don't want to push it underground. You want to expose it and make it radioactive. It's not a binary issue. There's a continuum there. Doc, uh, Nina Larson, do you have a sense about whether things are being done differently with the Muslim community in the United States than in Europe that might explain why Europe is having to deal with all this and the United States is not right now? Well, I think it's, it's the migration problem. Um, it's really, you know, we've got this great influx of migrants coming from, from Africa, from Libya, and, and of course those troubled countries like Syria. And, um, and Iraq, you know, and Afghanistan. Uh, but, you know, I, I don't want to speculate too much about this because we simply don't know who this individual is. Uh, quite often in Europe, it's people that have grown up there or have been living in the community for years. And uh, the British have a very, very strong counter-terrorism infrastructure. They're very, they're very on this kind of thing. And uh, the Prime Minister, Theresa May, seemed a bit offended by Donald Trump's uh, rather premature tweet earlier on suggesting that Scotland Yard had these people, and I'm quoting it, in their sights, and she actually responded. Uh, she didn't mention the president by name, but she said, look, you know, it's not helpful with people making these kind of comments. This is an ongoing investigation. Yes, it's very likely that whoever did this uh, or the cell they may belong to has been on the radar of uh, the intelligence services in the United Kingdom. But um, again, I just don't want to speculate about this too much. It's a very, very delicate issue. And, and all too often, uh, you know, people fleeing conflict and, and economic migrants uh, just wanting a better life are, are sort of tarred with the same brush. We just don't know who this is at the moment. It doesn't look like a very sophisticated attack. It's a bucket bomb, um, you know, a homemade device. But again, I, I really feel like it's too early to say. Right. Uh... One of our guests alluding to the fact that this could have been a test run for them with that uh, unsophisticated bomb that didn't have any shrapnel. We're going to have to leave it there. Nina Larson, thank you very much. Dr. Judy Josser, Dan Raviv, and Tal Heinrich, thank you all.